crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till Appreciate it. It's so beautiful. Well, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, second chapter of the book of Revelations. It was just a week ago today that um, I got out of the pulpit Sunday morning, and, and uh, after you all left, I shook your hands, and, and then uh, my family and, and Pastor Josh and his family, we loaded up the van, and we drove 16 hours to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a conference and spent some time uh, down in that area. We had a wonderful time. We just got back in yesterday. Um, it was a long drive, and uh, it was such a great time. My kids got to go on a swamp tour and, and hold a baby alligator, and we got to go to uh, New Orleans, and, and that was a lot of, well, that was interesting. <laughs> My kids saw some things maybe they had some questions about, and, uh, but I'll tell you the best part was spending time with the Alexanders. It was so wonderful. Uh, I didn't know what it'd be like. I mean, you know, they had to be around me for a long time, but uh, I got to spend some time with them. We got to stay in, in uh, Joanna, Sister Joanna's house uh, growing up where her mom and dad, and, and, you know, she's got eight siblings, too. So I got to meet seven of them, no, six of them. I met to get to meet six of them, but the best part was spending time with her family. They were the greatest host you could ever imagine. When it was time to leave, I think, you know, like grandkids are kissing grandpa and grandma, and they're saying goodbye, and I think I was the only one crying. I, 
I'm going to miss Joanna's parents. They were so good to us. We walked in, and they had a room prepared for us, and they had all of our favorite snacks already there. They even went, and they humbled themselves enough to go to the store and get ensuite iced tea for me. <laughs> and I, we really enjoyed them. Uh, uh, Joanna's father, what a good Christian man they have in the household there, and a good Christian wife. And I just really, really it refreshed my heart. The preaching was good, the conference was good, but I sure enjoyed spending my time with them. And uh, if I never get in that van ever again, that'll be okay. Uh, that's 30, almost 40 hours of, with six little kids in various stages of potty training. Um, that, was, that was really fun. If you if found yourself in Revelation chapter 2, would you stand for the reading of God's word if you're able? We're going to look at the first seven verses. We're going to look at the letter to the church of Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, the word of God says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he which holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience. And for my name's sake hath labored and hath not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place. Except thou repent. But this thou hast. Thou hatest the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Our Father, Lord, I pray you bless the reading of your word today. And Lord, may your word speak to every heart and mind that we have here. And let's start with me. Lord, I pray today that, Lord, we would understand what it is to love you more. Lord, I, maybe there's, there's one struggling here today with even the idea of heaven or hell or salvation. Lord, may you settle that today. Lord, I imagine there's probably some here before me that they've bought into the lie that truly they could never be loved by the God of the universe. And Lord, I pray today the truth would speak louder than any lie they may have. Lord, I pray today that each and every one of us would rest in your love today and that love would be reflected back to you. Lord, I pray that wherever we're at with you, may we leave this place closer. Lord, help us to love you more and we'll just give you the praise, honor, and glory in your name, which is all due. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated today. I'd like to preach a message out of this passage of Scripture about the church of Ephesus entitled, A Church Almost All In. Our theme this year has been all in. And this will be the first, here we are in March, the first kind of the negative example of all in. We've looked at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We spent four weeks with Enoch. Enoch is a great example of what a child of God looks like when they're all in. And this will be the first negative example. And the church of Ephesus gets a lot of praise, but we see here they're not all in. They're, they're almost, almost all in. But when it comes to Christ, almost is not good enough. I, I think of in the book of Acts where Paul speaks to Agrippa, and Agrippa says, you know, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Well, how far will that get you in heaven? I, I tell you, unless he's changed his mind, he is not almost in heaven. He's completely in hell and away from heaven because he was almost, he came close, just didn't go across that line. He went most the way, but go most the way doesn't count. He had to go all in. When it comes to Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't almost live a perfect life for us. And praise God, he lived a perfect life. Jesus didn't almost die on the cross for us. He didn't almost rise from the dead. Uh, He's not almost making intercession for us at this time. And he didn't almost promise to come back, did he? You see, almost can't exist with all in. And I'm afraid sometimes when I stand here and I say all in, all in, all in, I'm afraid you're hearing a little bit more. Just take another step. Just go a little bit further. And that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying all in, all or nothing. Now, we see in this church right here, and let's just call this the First Baptist Church of Ephesus, there's a letter written. Now, if you were to see the context of 
chapter 1, you would see this Jesus speaking to the messenger, whether it be the angel or the pastor of the church, giving this specific message to one of the seven churches of Asia. And just so we're clear, in verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear. This is applicable to us here today about this. And we see a church here that was almost in. They were almost in. There's so much praise when you're reading this. And this is coming from the lips of Jesus Christ. And he's, he's praising them. He's heaping this praise. Everything they're doing right. But then he gets to, what is that, verse four. And he says, nevertheless, oof, yikes. Don't want to hear that when all the praise is coming. That's how my generation rebukes. I don't know if you've noticed this. That's what millennials do. If we're going to rebuke, you know, back in the, the, the good generations before us, you know, if they had to tell you there's something wrong with you, they'd just call you in the office and yell at you, you know. We, don't, we can't do that nowadays. So we, we come in, you know, you're doing a lot of this. You're doing really good. But this, you got to get to. Well, here's where we're at right here. All this praise, nevertheless, oof. They were almost all in. And what we see here, and we read all this, is it's not enough to have a religion that's doing all the right things. They were doing all the good works. And he says, hey, I know your works. And you haven't given up. You haven't fainted. You're doing great. And by the way, you also hate the right things. You say, what, we're talking about hate today? Well, he says you hate. There's some things that just need to be hated. Okay, if you love God, you hate sin. Okay, as simple as that. You love life, you hate death. It's as simple as that. He says, you guys not only love the right things, you hate the right things. And then above that, you have the right standards. He says, there's these people that are trying to come in there, these apostles, they want to do things their way, at least they say they are. He says, no, they don't meet your standards. They don't meet the right standards. Here's a church with standards. Here's a church doing all the right things. Here's a church that hates all the right things, and still they're almost in. They're missing something. And by the way, these are all good, necessary things for a child of God and for a church. We should do the right things. We should hate the right things. And we should have good standards. We should have right standards. We should. But that's not enough. I think a lot of times we might stop at that and go, hey, but look at this. We got everything going. But right here he says, Jesus says, hey, if you don't get this fixed, your church is done. I'm getting rid of your church. We can never forget, yeah, church is more than a building. It's a group of people. We have all over the country today, church doors closing, mosque moving in, okay? There could be a different church that could move in here. This is something very serious that we have here that we have to look at because almost to Jesus for his church wasn't enough. In verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you've left your first love. You've left your first love. Can you just for a moment humor me just for a moment and just think for a quick time? In the blink of an eye, I don't know if it's going to be through death doors or through rapture, but all of a sudden you find yourself standing before God. And all of a sudden you know, this is it, I'm dead. My life is over, the chapter is complete, the game is over. Now it's time for the Monday morning commentary of my life. I can't undo, I can't fix anything. Anything that was left undone will remain undone forever. Here it is, I'm done standing before God. And could you imagine, maybe this is your life a little bit. You hear verse 2, he says, I know your works. I know your labor and your patience. I know you can't even bear them that are evil. You are holy. You hate even the garment spotted. Man, you haven't fainted. You haven't given up. I, I've been around ministry long enough, man. My heroes of the faith, I, I, I've lost so many. They just, they've fainted. They've given up. But he says, oh, you've done it. You crossed the finish line. You've labored in my name's sake. You helped those in, in the name of Christ. And you did all these things. Man, maybe at that point, the Lord's telling you this, and you might be thinking like, okay, all right. <laughs> this is good. All these great things you've done. And then all of a sudden you hear it from the lips of God. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Ooh. All that high praise. He says, here's the thing. You've left your first love. You left. You left your first love. Now, just so we understand the verbiage of this text right here and exactly what Jesus is saying, he's not saying it in the context that we would say, oh, everybody remembers their first love. You know, when you're in middle school in seventh grade, you know, and you meet little Susie so-and-so, and you just love her, and you guys were dated for two years until she's talked to Johnny about something, and 
I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about in college, that, that first, you know, oh man, I just really love that person. They broke my heart. And, but there's more fish in this. That's not what he's talking about. First as in rank of order of priority. Yeah, there's some great loves. And we all know, the Bible tells us kind of our order of love, right? Right? The acronym for joy. You remember the acronym, you want to have joy in your life? Put Jesus first, others second, yourself third. Any other way, you're going to be miserable. Jesus goes first. He says, you left your first love. You, you, you left me. Jesus, you left your relationship with, with me. You're still doing all the religious stuff. You're going through the motions. You, man, you guys, again, you're doing everything right, and, and you haven't fainted. You're, you're still going. But he says, man, I got this, this thing against you. you Jesus knows the heart. He says, you, you left your first love. You don't love God anymore like you used to. This is the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus tells us, love your God with all your heart, with all your... Jesus tells us, you've got to love God more than your own family. He says, you've got to love him so much, it looks like almost hatred. You love less than anything else. And he says, it's better to be destroyed than to remain like this. But I'm so thankful that he says, left your first love. You know, notice here, we would probably say something different in our day. We would say, you've fallen out of your first love. That's what we say. And I'm so thankful. It's falling is just like, hey, I can't help it. It's just gravity. I, if I fall, I, I trip off these stairs. Nobody's going to expect me to float across the room, right? I, I, you know, that's the way you're looking at it. And so you know, we tell me, well, we're getting a divorce. We just fell out of love. There's no such thing as falling out of love because love is a choice. He says, you left it. You, you, can, you can use all the pretty language you want and just say, well, we grew apart. We did, did. No, you turned around and you walked away. You abandoned your love. That's what he's saying. He's calling them out. You've abandoned. There was a time, man, you walked with me as a church, but you turned around and you walked away and you left. But the beauty of leaving is you can turn around and go back. And he tells them in the next verse, here's how you do that. Because if you fall, I've jumped out of two airplanes in my life, never again. And I, I've never been like I'm a half my way down going, you know what? I think I'm going to go back up in the plane, right? I can't. <laughs> You know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work, right? You haven't fallen on love. You left your love, and it's time to get back, is what he's saying. And he tells them exactly how in three steps. I will be very brief this morning. But the first thing I see here in verse 5, what's that first word? Can you cry it out for me? Remember. Say it again. Remember. Remember what? Well, go back and remember from whence thou art fallen. Now, Pastor, you just said falling on love. No, he's talking about something different here. He says, remember if you had a position, and man, when you left, you fell from that position. Remember from whence you were fallen. Let me rephrase it like this. Remember how good you had it. When you were a new church, when you loved the Lord, and yes, you were doing all the same things, and yes, you had the same problems, and yes, it was, was, it was but there was something different. So you remember that when you loved me, it was different. There's something missing. Watch from when you were fallen. You know, I grew up, probably not sometimes the greatest influences in my life, but I grew up a lot at, at, with my grandpa and grandma, and my grandpa, he passed away, I think he was like 95, and this is some time ago, so my grandpa, he was in World War II, he's of that generation, and when I was a little kid, I'd sit in my grandpa's lap, and we would watch uh, his shows, okay, I'd sit, my, I'm five, six, seven years old, I'm watching Divorce Court with my grandpa, <laughs> my grandpa was a different generation, okay, and grandpa many times, would, I don't know how he did this, my grandpa would have been a great marriage counselor because he could solve, he, he identified and solved every one of those couple's problems. It could be, you know, well, the man, he, he took all the money, started a new family, ran, this guy could be an absolute sleazeball. And he'd be like, you know it's the woman's fault, right? She, I mean, I don't know how he did, it's amazing. I don't know how, it'd be, you watch these shows, I'm sure you've all seen them, and you know, they're just, they're just, they're, they're one, the husband's on one side of the court, the wife's on the other side, and all they do is attack each other for our enjoyment, Right? And you're just like, man, these people, these aren't even strangers. They hate each other. I mean, they are just going for blood. They're telling everybody how terrible things are. And then you're watching this, and I'm thinking to myself, do you know, there must have been a time where they were courting and they loved each other. There must have been a time when they just looked in each other's eyes and, and life was beautiful. I mean, they're, they're, all the hope of all their life is, is going to be ahead of them, and, and they, just, they just cannot wait to be together. Y'all remember that time? Do you remember, I'm saying y'all now a lot too. I see, it'll take me a couple of weeks to get the, get the Louisiana on my, on my, you guys, you know you guys. 
You know this? I mean, they're ahead of the time they got to the altar, and, and, and the pastor's going, do you take you? And they're all like, oh, I can't wait. So this is, this is going to be so wonderful, and we're going to have a family together. And, and there just had to have been a time where they were deeply, madly in love with each other. And man, I can tell you, if you can go back to say, wait, what's better, your wedding day, your honeymoon, or the day at court when you're separating? I would think they would all say, if they're honest, man, back when we were in love, back when we loved each other. Oh, it's so wonderful. It was better then. Remember from how far you've gotten from the altar to the courtroom. Remember how good it was. Can I just for a moment, let's just walk down a little path here together. But uh, remember, remember when you love God first. Can I, can I get you, to, well, just a moment, we'll turn to 1 John 4. But don't, don't turn there, but don't, don't tune me out for a second, okay? 1 John 4, but man, loving God first. When you knew, there was no question. God, I just love you so much. I love you so much, I'm making other people angry. They feel like I'm choosing you over them. God, I would just, I, would get, I, I just wish I had more to give up for you. I remember my daughter being born and holding her. And the boys, when they were born, they, they were different. Their eyes would cross at me weird and stuff. And I was like, oh, something's broken with this one, you know? Lydia, Lydia locked on me. And everybody, every father has told me a daughter and a dad is, is just different. And I remember Lydia, and I remember looking at her, and I'm telling her, I'm like, no guy's ever going to be good enough for you, sweetheart. You know, I'm, I'm telling her this, like, she's not even an hour old yet, you know. And, and I remember thinking, like, man, I just, I just wish a biker gang would break in here and insult her so I could beat them up. Like, I just, I just, I wanted more. I wanted to fight somebody. I wanted to, I just, I don't know what it was. And, and do you remember that with the Lord where it's just like, man, I wish a wicked sinner would walk in here. I just, I just wish somebody would use God's name in vain. I'm going to, I'm going to, I love God so much. I love him more than my sin. I love him more than any idol in my life and any stronghold I may have had. I just, I just love him so much. It just, it hurts. I want to do more. And you find out when that happens, the joy, you don't have to search for it. It's just there. You just love him because there's joy. And you almost find yourself weeping, thinking about him and reading the scriptures. And, and sin, man, you're not going to stumble because you love him so much more than the sin makes you feel, more than the pleasures of a season. I, I just want to be with him. That's all I want. I'm not worried about finances. God will take care of me. I just, I love him so much. I want to tell one more person about him. I, want to, I just want to please him. I want to show him my love. Do you remember that time? Do you remember getting saved? Oh, we're in 1 John. Let me, let me hurry up and get there. Chapter 4. I'm going to, it's a great passage. You really should read the whole thing. I guess I didn't mark it in my Bible. But you know what I'm going to talk about in chapter 4 right here. Look at this in verse 10. Here in his love... Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, can I just be really quick like there? Propitiate means to satisfy the wrath, to satisfy the wrath of God. That here's the thing. This is what he's telling us right here. God loves you. Don't worry about you loving God right now, okay? First and foremost, before you even knew better, God loved you so much. But he knew there was something separating you from him. It was your sin. Somebody, something had to sacrifice. There had to be a propitiation to satisfy the wrath, Okay? You know this. You have a relationship, maybe in the church, maybe in your family, and man, you sure would love things to go back the way they were, but there's this, and somebody has to deal with this. Whether it's be, please, please forgive me, make amends, but there's this, and it's, it's not just a little oopsie poopsies. This is the sin of mankind, okay? There's rebelled against a holy God. Somebody had to pay, and so God says, I'm going to send my only son. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to be the propitiation for you because I love you so much. And I want you because I choose you to be with me. And I just want to stop for a moment and say, do you remember how wonderful it is to be fully, 100%, unconditionally loved by somebody? Do you remember that? Do you remember that when you first got saved and it's just like, the God of all creation loves me. You're reading the Bible and it says, in the beginning, God created. And you're like, that's him. He loves me. All of a sudden, you're reading through the scriptures and, you know, God's, you know, he's doing these God stuff. And you're just like, that's my God. He loves me. And you just know, and you just kind of bask in that love. And you just exist and you grow in that love. He loves me so, so, so much. And then what comes after that? Well, I got to skip through some scripture here. But look at verse 19. It says, we love him. Here's a reason why. Because we finally understand his love for us. 
We love him because he loves us, and we just can't help when we, we bask in that love that we just go, oh man, I love him so much because he loves me. He loves me. Man, when you're there, you know you're there. The Christian life's no longer a burden. Ah, we got to go do this. We got to go to church. We got to write the tithe check. We got to, we got to. Man, I'm telling you, you love the Lord. Oh, it's so good. I don't got to, I want to. Lord, what can I do more? There's so many times, you know, when I was an altar runner back in the day, an altar run is anything further than the traditional marathon, 26.2 miles. And I remember I was kind of in that group, you know, and I remember a lot of people go, what's the littlest I can do to be considered an ultra marathoner, you know? Can I just do on one step past a marathon? Am I an altar? I said, what a terrible way to look at things. I know people want to argue all about the faith, and they always want to argue, what's the littlest I can do for God? I say, man, you don't understand his love. Man, what more can I do for you, Lord? What more can I do for you? I wish there was something else I could sacrifice for you, Lord. I just want to show you how much I love you. Where the Christian life's not a burden, victory is easy. I just, Lord, I just love you so much. I don't, I'm not tempted by these things. I'm just focused on you. I want, I want to be with you. Loving others comes natural. I just, I, I'm so happy to be in church. I just, I just want to be around other Christians and we can talk about God's love. I told you, I absolutely, if you tell me what's the best part of spending this last week, I'd say being in a Christian home where people love each other. I loved that. I absolutely adored that. I just wanted to keep my family there longer. I, I wish I would have missed the bus somehow. And Pastor Josh could have came back and, and he could take the message this morning. It was amazing because it's just so wonderful. The love and to be loved. To love someone, something so much greater than even yourself. To have that reckless love and experience real peace. Her Wednesday night, Brother Rob preached, uh, taught a message on the peace of God. I heard it was really good. To have that peace in a peaceless world. To experience that joy. Now, I'm not saying it means everything in your life is all of a sudden clicked and everything's working out perfect and now I can finally have joy. Listen, real life doesn't work out that way. If you don't have joy now, you ain't going to get it. So you better go stop looking for joy in the world and go back to him and find it. There's joy in Jesus, my friends. There's joy in Jesus. Contentment. Got to have this. Got to do this. Got to oh, just say, Lord, I just, you're enough. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You're walking with him in love. His direction is so clear in your life. This day and age is so strange. Christians are like, have some weird voodoo to try to figure out how to figure out God's will for their life. Listen, when you're walking with the Lord, it ain't hard. It's not an enigma. It's very simple. When you're walking with him, you love him. I mean, God makes it so clear, abundantly clear. And we don't have to go do all the weird voodoo doo doo, kind of figure out, well, I think if God does this, I better lay a fleece out. And Oh, my word. It's so simple. No need to play games. Oh, when we love him more than anything else. Man, but sometimes, maybe you've been saved for a while, and you understand, you're like, yeah, oh, oh, that's all right. That was amazing. I love that time in my life. And then we just get busy. I don't know. I don't know what happened. The church at Ephesus got busy. They had other things to do. Relationship turned slowly into religion. And that's what they're left with. Maybe it was like Martha, Martha, Martha. You're so cumbered about with all these serving. Your sister picked the better thing. You've gotten so, you've, you've just, you got so focused on doing the right thing, hating the wrong thing, having good standards, which are all things that are necessary and good, but you got away from your love. And maybe this all seems foreign to you this morning. I don't know where your heart is at today. But before I move on, I want you to know that God desires to have a relationship with you. This is not something I've made up. This is not something the church has made up. This is the God of the universe. He's showed it to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He showed it to us in his word. This is what I heard, and I chose to give my life to Christ when I heard this message. That he desires to have a relationship with you because he loves you. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear, well, he loves everybody but you because you, we don't know what you did. He knows what you did, and he loves you anyways. He will take you in, and I'm telling you what, the dirtiest, the rottenest of scoundrels, of sinners in this world, I've seen God restore and elevate to be a trophy of his grace. Amen. Don't hold back from him. Jesus Christ is the only propitiation. He's the only way onto the Father. You have to come to Jesus by faith because he's the one who died for your sins and is resurrected to live forever with 
Lord, and for a comeback long, get us here hopefully really soon. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you can experience joy, contentment, and peace. Christians, can I get a testify here, okay? Look, I am not making those concepts up. If you experience joy, contentment, and peace with the Lord Jesus Christ, raise your hand. Listen, these are not liars. You're in the house of God, okay? It exists, it's there, and it's only found in Christ. It's only found in his wonderful love. Remember how far, maybe you got the same thing in your life, and you're like, man, I used to walk with him. I used to, I used to, I used to. And now all of a sudden, I just have this, this shell of a religion. I come to church because that's what we do. I, I give because that's what I'm supposed to do. I serve the Lord just because somebody needs to. And, and, and you don't really realize it, but you've, you've walked away from that love, and, and, and now there's just not much left there to hold on to. And it just, he says, remember. Just go back and remember. Remember the honeymoon. Remember, remember the wedding day. Remember that time you had and remember how great it was, and just look at your life compared to that now. He says, just, that's all I want you to do. That's step one. Remember, that's the easy part. That's point one. Remember, that's the easy part, right? Then he says in verse five, our second point says, remember front there are fallen. He says, and repent. Repent. This is going to be a little bit more difficult. Okay, remembering is easy. This is going to be harder, okay? We're getting a little bit harder here. Repent. Change your mind. This is a little bit differently. Repent means to think differently. We've talked about in, in, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 2, right? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. How we transformed by the renewing of our, our minds. We have to think differently. Think different, behave different, feel different. That's what we have to do. But he says, here's the motivation. Remember where you've fallen. Remember how good it was. Remember what it was to just love God and be loved by God. And that's all you needed in the world was that. Anything else could happen. And you're just like, ah, I hope the rapture sticks. I just want to be with. Go back to this. He says, go back there in your mind. Remember that. And he says, here's what I want you to do. If back then was better, then change. If back then, if you remember right now how finally you feel a little guilt, like, man, my love relationship with the Lord has faded I've given up ground in my life. It's not what it used to be. Then change. Then change. You can do it. Listen, you left, go back. Okay? You left. Go. In fact, I think I left my, my favorite pair of socks joined at your parents' house. I think I might have to go back and go. I'm teasing, of course. Right? Another 32 hours. The van has no cruise control. It's just, and no radio. But Pastor Josh sang the whole way. No, I'm just teasing. You ever been, a lot of husbands, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, some of you guys have figured this out, but if you haven't, I'm going to help you out, okay? All right, I've learned this. This took me, I've been married for almost 20 years. It took me a long time to learn this, right? When something bad happens to your wife or she doesn't like it, she wants to come home and tell you about it. Some would say it's complaining, but that doesn't sound right. So I'll just say complaining adjacent, all right? Oh, you're not going to believe it. I had to deal with the kids today and, and then at work and then so on. And that's what they want to do, right? Now, Here's what you're tempted to do. Honey, let me fix all your problems. Right? Let me just go ahead and, honey, as a spiritual leader of this household, I will instruct you. You want to come to find out? They don't like that. You know what they want? Guys, this is going to help you out in life, okay? Ready for this? <clears throat> wow. That sounds terrible. Guys, repeat after me. Wow. That sounds terrible. Now, word it in different ways. Don't keep saying the same thing over and over again, right? <laughs> really? That stinks. That's what we got to do, right? Now, ladies, now understand, we will do this the best we can, okay? But sooner or later, you know what we're thinking the whole time? Well, good night. If you don't like it, change. If you don't like it, like when you, you start telling us the same problem over and over and over again, we're like, what's the common denominator here? <laughs> Make a change. Do something different, okay? That's all we're saying. You are allowed to change things. You are allowed to do something different, okay? And what he's saying here is remember how good it was and look at your life now. You walked away from me. You don't love me anymore. Your relationship's not it's, it's, it's as passionate as it used to be anymore. And it was so much better. He says, I want you to think about that. And I said, I want you to think about it and make a change in your heart. I want you to make a change of your mind. I want to choose to love the Lord. You left, choose to go back. She said, it's not that simple. Yes, it is. Why not? You don't like it because a lot of people want to be like that wife that sits around and goes, oh, Christianity, oh, I got to do that. Oh, yeah, everything is so terrible. Hey, if you don't like it, change. The devil will always take you back anyways. You want to go to the Lord? Love him. Love him. Make a change. 
It's a complete restructure. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm, I'm going to read, I'm going to cut into the text a little bit here, but we're going to start up in, uh, let's go to verse 31. We know the context of Matthew chapter 6. Uh, no man can serve two masters. He's basically like, hey, everybody else in this world wants to accumulate wealth. Christians, that's not your job. Now, by the way, if God gives you wealth, praise the Lord, right? Having, having money is not a sin, right? But it becomes your master, it is, okay? He says, so since that's not your, your deal, as Christians, I'm going to give you something better to do, okay? And he says, you're not going to be worried about what am I going to put on? What am I going to eat? What am I going to deal with all these things? He says, I'm going to give you something better to worry about, something better to think about, okay? He's, he's restructuring our minds right here. In verse 31, Jesus says, Wherefore, or therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Whether shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Thank you, Lord. He says, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You were so encumbered about with all these things, the Lord says, I'll just take care of it. You just come after me. That's your job. I'll, you, I'll, listen, I'll worry about you. you. You love me. That's it. I'll take care of you. I'm a good shepherd. I know how to feed you. I know how to give you everything you need in life, but here's what you got to do. Come after me first. Jesus is the first love. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's where our hearts need to be first. Go back and repent because you left your first love. And if we see a symptom of leaving our first love, there's the anxiousness here. So full of thought and care. Oh, what are we going to do if this happens, the economy happens, and so-and-so gets elected? Oh, we're not, I'm not going to be able to close on my back. How are we going to put gas in the gas tank? And, da, 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 da. and he says, all these things are lost people. Let the lost people worry about that. He says, you got one bigger job to do. You seek me, and I'll take care of you. He says, these things we add on to you. Verse 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil. He says, worry about the evil today. Don't worry about the evil tomorrow. I'll take care of today. He says, that's what everybody's so worried about. We're so worried about what's going to happen. What's going to happen. Just let the Lord deal with it. He knows what he's doing. We get anxious. And this is the only way life works. Boy, Lord's got to be first. Boy, that seems, what a big, listen, because he knows that's what works for us. Either that, we put him first, or we run around here all anxious all the time. We, that's our choice. We can seek him and he's going to take care of us or we just run around we just, oh, I'm so worried all the time. What's going to happen? We don't have to do that. And can I just make, I got to move on really quickly here. But uh, listen, don't wait for a convenient time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God means now. When he says in our, in our text in Revelation chapter two, he says repent, he means now. When's the best time to repent? The best time to repent is when you know you're wrong. Let me rephrase that. The best time to repent is when you realize you're heading in the wrong direction. If ever a time, so we did, we drove for 16 hours, and I was not familiar with most of these roads. I was not familiar with a lot of this. And luckily, by the grace of God, uh, Apple Maps got us where we needed to go. But I can only imagine, and actually there was one time where I was actually heading down, and Pastor Josh fell asleep, and my, uh, my phone re rerouted us. And uh, I think Pastor Josh wakes up, he goes to the front seat, and he goes, oh, you're going, you decided to go through Memphis, huh? And was that what it was, Josh? I don't remember what it was. So I, okay. Uh, I said, look, I'm just, I said, is it wrong? Did I, I, oops, did I mess up? I mean, I've never been down this far before. This is as furthest I've ever been, you know? And he said, no, no, it's just a different way. Now, if he would have said, yeah, you're going to Nevada or whatever it was, well, brother Josh, let's pray about it for a little bit, you know? <laughs> so let's have a pro and con list, right, about what we, what, the second I realize I'm wrong, turn around because it's that much further to come back. They're wasting that much energy, that much gas. The second you realize you're wrong, turn around, seek, come back. There's no time to think about it. If you realize through anything of the foolishness that I've said today, and you said, man, it was better with the Lord. It was better when I just loved him. Then don't go home and think about it. This is not buying a car. You have to talk to your wife about it. Turn around, repent, and go back. It's as simple as that. Realize you're wrong. I know sometimes a lot of people, and maybe another situation I could probably give you, maybe this didn't happen, but can you imagine, Pastor Josh, you wake up, and all of a sudden you realize, I am going the wrong side of the expressway, the wrong direction, okay? Lights are going, wow, 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 they probably, you know, and, uh, you know, Pastor Josh, whoa, 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 you are going the wrong, you're doing the wrong thing. I know, I realize that, but, you know, if I turn off now, I'll be so embarrassed. <laughs> people will see that I was, that I thought I was... You know one thing I learned about real Christians? Man, they sure love to see Christians get right. They sure love to see sinners get right. I, sometimes the world says, oh, Christians are so judgmental. I mean, maybe some, I don't know, but the real ones you want by your side, 
they're going to be so excited for you to get saved. They'll be so excited for you to repent. They'll be so excited for you to say, I went the wrong direction, but man, I got it right. I got to move quickly because it says remember, repent, but we have to go a little bit further. By the way, remember easy, okay? Repent, a little harder, okay? I'm wrong. The pride thing, that little pride thing, what will people think when they, don't worry about that. Just worry about what the Lord thinks of you, okay? Repent. By the way, Christians I've dealt with in my life, as a pastor, I've had to rebuke and, 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 and reprove. The ones that respond in pride and go, Pfft, I don't really have much respect for and I don't have much hope for. But man, there's been some Christians I've gotten after over and over again and they always respond with meekness and they always respond by listening. Oh, Brother Josh, I wish we could farm that, bottle it. People will love you for that. I gotta move on. There's the hardest one. You ready for the hardest part? Resolve to go all in service. That's what he says. He says, uh, remember from what thou have fallen, repent, and then do the first works. Go all in. This is the hardest part. You know what's right? And do it. Do it when you don't feel like it. You know what happens? A lot of times we get in this, this funk with the Lord. We get in this rut, and, and we just kind of get into this... And we do this in our relationships in our life, too, where it's just like the love's not burning hot no more. And then we're tempted to sideline ourselves from service. We're tempted to, you know, not take care of each other and love each other and sacrifice for each other because we're just kind of tempted to pull back and sideline a little bit. And he says, no, 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 no. Uh, don't wait to get things worked out. Go all in now where you're at. He says, go back and do the first works. The devil loves retreaters. You know what I was thinking about the devil? You know the difference? Well, there's a big difference between the devil and the God. God. God knows your mind. He hears your thoughts. The devil does not. Do you know everything the devil knows about you, you taught him? By listening to you and seeing how you respond? That's what the devil, the devil knows, hey, if I can make him retreat, I'm going to do it. The devil gets way too much victory. He learned, the devil loves a retreater. Go back. And by the way, it says go back and do the first. I've heard preachers preach it like this before. You know, it's kind of like if you were falling out of love with your wife and you had to go back and do the first. What were the first works? Take her out on dates. Buy her flowers like you. That's not what he's talking about right here. What are the first works? He's not saying, what's, your, you know, what's the first work? Get saved. Saved is not even a work. What do we do? He says, go back and do the most important the first of priority, the top, top, top. Go back and do those things. Do the, those works. Those are the big ones you need to be doing right now. By the way, they were doing works. You see that in verse 2? They were doing works, but not the first works. They were doing works. They were doing the right thing. That leads us to question ourselves right now, then what are the most important works for us? Well, we read it already in Matthew 6. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I believe the first work is fellowship with him. You're saved. Go back and fellowship with the Lord again. Get back in relationship and lockstep with him. Hey, you used to be Enoch. You used to walk with him. Life got busy. You had kids, got married. I don't know. Life got crazy. Overtime, boss needs all this. Money ran dry. I don't know. But listen, I don't care about any of that. Get back with the Lord. Nothing will be right until your relationship's back with the Lord. Have you ever found this? You live long enough to know when your relationship's not right with God, your relationship with your spouse isn't right. Your relationship with your friends isn't right. The relationship with church isn't right because you're not right with God. Go back there. Don't worry about those. Get back to the first works. Worshiping him. Not just coming to church, singing some songs, and putting an offering envelope. I mean, come to church and worship him. I was challenging my Sunday school class today. I said, do you realize God has something for you? I've stood at that door for hours and hours and hours after services. And like I said, every, every Sunday, without fail, there'll be a few people that will come out and they'll say, Pastor, thank you for the message. That was exactly what I needed. And, 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 and I'm like, yeah, it's great. And every once in a while, someone comes to you and say, Pastor, it was exactly the message I needed. And this is what God dealt with in the service. And it was nothing that I was preaching on. I'm going to tell you, God has something for you, even through the foolishness of preaching. The Holy Spirit of God will pull something, give you something, strengthen you today. If you're willing to worship him, to listen for him, praying, get back letting God's word work in your heart. Sometimes as Christians, oh man, we get saved, we're fired up. I'm going to read one more page, one more chapter. And then, ah, I get my Bible reading in. Ah, okay, one more chapter. Here we go, one more chapter. Just, and you get done reading it and you realize you didn't retain anything because you were thinking about something else, right? You find that you know that God's working in your heart, but you keep kicking against the pricks, right? 
let God lead you. Sometimes God will lead you in ways that does not make sense, but you'll figure it out later if you follow him. What's the first works? First works of loving God. Give him pleasure in a relationship with you. I think secondly, God makes it very clear. Jesus makes it very clear. He says, church, I'm leaving you here. Here's your marching orders. Great commission. Go out there and win souls. Whether it be your family, whether it be your coworkers, your neighbors, whether it's knocking on cold doors, he says, go out there and do, do, the, do the first works. Do the most important things today. Get back there and do those things. I said, yeah, I know. This is the hardest step. I get it. I get it. Remember, remember how good it was. Remember, remember how far you fall in your relationship with him. Repent, make a decision to change, and then resolve to go all in where I'm at right here and right now. Don't wait for it to make sense. Do it. And I say, what do you mean don't wait for it to make sense? If I was any, if I trying to sell you anything, that'd be the worst advice ever. But with the Lord, it makes perfect sense. I give the illustration to my children. We were I told my Sunday school class about this, but we were in a parking lot down in, in uh, I don't know where we were, to be honest with you, all look the same to me, down there in Louisiana somewhere, and Brother Josh had to stop and pick up the fried boudin balls. Who knows what a fried boudin ball is? Wow, just DJ and Christy, that's it. And Hannah, that's it, right? I've, I ate them, I still don't know what they are, to be honest with you. I'd probably appreciate it if you don't tell me. Uh, and uh, we, remember, we got six kids now. We are outnumbered. And a couple of the little littles, booked it across this parking lot, and there's cars coming in and out. And I remember I said, hey, stop! Come back here real quick. And the kids did. They immediately, and I'm so, and the Lord kind of impressed upon my heart that moment, like, man, I wish I was that obedient to God. You know what I would have did? I'm a little kid going, hee, hee, run to the, hee, hee. Kids are so, they have a death wish, don't they? <laughs> Moving traffic, hee. And all the trucks in Louisiana are like this big, you know. <laughs> and I would turn around and go, but Why? Give me a verse in scripture, you know. Give me, Lord, it doesn't, but, but, you know. It, but man, our kids were like, yes, sir. Came right back right away. And then you can sit down with them like, hey, I just don't want you to get smushed. That's it, you know, simple as that. Now, God may sometimes, but I follow the Lord to the point where, God, you don't even have to tell me. Don't, get, don't worry about giving me reasons, God. I'll trust you anyways. I want that for my children. Look at verse seven. We got to end this. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Hey, do you have ears? I got two of them. One even works, okay? <laughs> two of them, all right? That's for me. This is not for just the members of the First Baptist Church of Ephesus. This is for everybody. This is for Oxbow Lake Baptist Church today, right? He says here, this is for us, right? He says, to he that hear it, the Spirit saith the churches, to him that overcometh will I give the eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let me just make a comment on this. It will be done. In fact, uh, turn your Bibles, Genesis 3. We're going to talk about that tree of life in just a moment. But here we have, right? Overcome, okay? Victory. That was means. If you have victory, you have victory, there, there, there's something here for you. Now, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, he says, here is the victory. An overcomer is someone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ won the victory and we get to have it by faith. Putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that is the only way you're going to have victory and overcome. But he says, if you do this, okay, if you do this, you make this choice, you got a great reward right here, right? There is the tree of life, the tree, the, the tree of life, okay? The tree of life. We look at it back here. Remember, there was the two trees, there was two special trees in the garden. One was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan was like, yeah, that one, Eve. And she goes, okay, here, Adam, you know, and then great, thank you. Now we have sin and death, you know, but there's the tree of life. Now, before this, I think they were allowed to eat of it freely, and maybe they did. I don't know. But we found this other tree. But here's the problem. Look at verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 22. It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put his hand to take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence it was taken. Uh, so he drove out man, and he placed him in the east of the garden of the uh, Eden uh, cherubims and a flaming sword, which turneth every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God did not want Adam getting this tree. So what he did is he moved Adam from the tree. He placed guards in a flaming sword that turns whatever way. So you get to, why? Why is that? Because he says it right here in Scripture. Because man has fallen. If Adam and Eve were to take of that fruit of the tree of life, they would remain eternally life in the sinful state they're in. And out of God's mercy and grace, he says, you can't, you can't go, you can't touch this anymore. People say, well, where, where is it now? By the way, can you imagine living forever in a sinful world with no possibility of salvation? This is it. This is what, if, if Adam would have took, this would have been it. Like this life right now, hey, want to talk about having no hope? Can you imagine that? This is it. We're going to be like this forever. 
all the wars, all the sin, all the pain, all the separation, all, all these, all these, all these. So God says, no, 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 I can't let that happen. That's called about going all in the wrong way. Well, go to the very other end of Scripture. Last Scripture I have for you. We'll be done. Revelation 22. We find in the new heaven a familiar tree called the tree of life. Man, we're going to get raptured someday. We're entering in by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he takes us into his heaven, we're glorified bodies. We're free from the, the penalty of sin, the, the, the presence of sin. We are, we are been there for 10,000 years. We sing today. Oh, man, it's going to be so great. We are in the presence, and, and, and we're there, and, and there's no more sin and everything. And he goes, okay, now, now, now you can enjoy this wonderful Look at verse 1 and 2 of chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was, or was there, the tree of life, which bare twelve manner fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I see right there that he's shown us this eternal life we get to have with him forever in his presence but you know what? You'll never get there almost all in. I wonder today, maybe, are you an almost all in Christian today? I'm doing the right things. I'm saying the right things. I hate the right things. I'm, I have the right standards in my life, but man, my love for my Lord is not what it used to be. It just, something happened. I got busy. It's not as passionate as it once was. You know, the beauty of leaving is coming back. I've laid out the framework. I've preached it right out of the scripture right here. You got to remember. You got to choose to remember. You got to choose to repent. I can't make that choice for you. Man, I wish I could. You got to choose to have that joy back. You got to choose to walk with the Lord back there and then resolve to go all in where you're at right now. That is the hardest part. But boy, when we get back with the Lord, we come back to him. I can't think of the prodigal son coming back and his father's waiting. He thought he was going to come back as a servant and a second class citizen. He came back as royalty. They put on them the they put the greatest meal together, put on the robe and the ring, and, and man, they threw a party for him. Oh, it's so good to come back. Man, would you come and just make a choice and say, Am I an almost Christian? Am I doing almost all the right things? Do I have the one thing that's most important right? Oh Lord, I love you today. Show them how much you love them today. Take that step of faith towards them. Have every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. I just wonder today. There be anyone here today, so you know, all this talk about salvation and getting saved and heaven and all that, the Lord has spoken to my heart, and I'm not sure I know if I'm, a sa if I'm saved today. I don't know if I've ever placed my faith and trust in Jesus. I don't know if I were to die today where I'd go, but boy, I sure want to go to heaven. If that's you, can you just slip your hand up, put it right back down? I won't embarrass you, I won't come to you, I won't call you out. But is that like you today? I can remember in closing prayer. I don't, I don't know if I'm saved. Is there anyone here today who would say, you know, Scripture spoke to my heart today, and I've been, I've been doing my best to do the right things, but the Lord convicted me about my love for him. Pastor, you pray for me. Is that you today? Just slip your hand right up. Remember in closing prayer, my love's not what it should be. It once was. And if that's you today, then my question is, okay, you realized it. Now it's time to repent. It's time to resolve to go all in. It's time to do something about it. Can you imagine now if God says, now you knew, you raised your hand, you knew in your heart. You knew it wasn't right, and yet you remained. You, you chose to let it stay that way. Can you imagine that? In just a moment, after I'm praying, the organ will play for as long as we need. The altar's already got people down here praying. You're welcome to step out. You can pray in your own seat. And you can say, Lord, I don't know much, but I know I love you today, and I want to love you more. Lord, help me to walk with you more. Lord, let me be more in love with you than I've ever been in my life. Lord, I love you today. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just preach the message the best I know how that you placed upon my heart. Lord, let it not be a, a message from a, a hypocrite. Lord, I pray that, Lord, I would learn to love you more. That, Lord, serving you is not a burden. It's a blessing. Lord, I just want to pray for this congregation. There's many that raised their hand and said, Lord, it's time to love you more. So, Lord, let's put some actions, put some legs to our words, and let us love you more today. Lord, if there be one here that's not saved, let him step out today by faith. Talk to Pastor Josh and learn what joy, contentment, and peace really is. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, your heads bowed, eyes closed. For altars open if you'd like to come forward, as many have already. What a great opportunity. We're going to stand before God someday. And he's going to say, hey, you did some good things. 
Look at you. You got some good works. Oh, but you know what? Something's wrong in the love department. You missed the big one. Did all the right things and you were almost there. You missed the big one because you left. It's time to get back. Can you imagine your spouse pulling you aside and saying, hey, I'll still serve you. I'll do everything I'm supposed to do contractually. I just want to let you know I'm not going to love you, though. You'd say, that's not enough. Can you imagine your pastor getting in the pulpit and saying, church, I'm going to serve you, but I don't love you. I'll do what I'm supposed to do by the Bible, but I don't love you. You say, that's not enough. Bingo, you got it. And God says, hey, you're doing some good things, but your love, something's wrong. It's sick. You're anxious. It's not right. Come back. Come back. Father, again, we love you so much today. Thank you for sending Jesus. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we may never be a perfect church on this side of eternity. We never, we never get everything figured out. But, Lord, there's one thing we can do today is we can love you. Help us to love you today, Lord. Help us to, to let anyone comes in here and drives by here, let them hit us the church that loves their God. So, Lord, thank you. And thank you for loving us. Thank you for the proof of your love and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was a propitiation for our sins.